While the early move to general mobilisation meant the Ukrainian army was probably never going to be short on manpower, the army did face a number of critical issues from the very earliest days of the war, you know, other than the missile strikes and the Russian attackers. Namely, what on earth was it going to arm all of the volunteers and new recruits with? Because as much as some Russian commentators on state TV like to say that Ukraine was basically a NATO army, just about everything the Ukrainians had in service before the Russians invaded was Soviet-era equipment. From small arms to surface-to-air missile launchers, with a fresh coat of paint, the application of a red flag, most of this stuff would not have looked out of place at a parade on Red Square in 1985. And given that most of the countries looking to resupply Ukraine with weapons were Western NATO nations, well, that presented a problem. Military equipment isn't exactly interchangeable, plug and play. You take a mechanic who's used to maintaining a Soviet-era diesel engine in a T-72, and you drop the gas turbine engine of an M1 Abrams in front of him, he's going to have some questions. And so while in the long run, Ukraine had the ability to transition over to NATO hardware in some categories, in the here and now, in February, March and April, what the nation really needed was more Soviet-era kit. Some of that would come from Ukraine's own reserve stocks and warehouses. The rest would come from emptying the stockpile of just about every Soviet-era munition out of most Eastern and Central European countries. The Poles, the Czechs, the Baltic states would send armoured vehicles by the hundreds. But it was never going to be enough to both allow Ukraine to equip as many new units as it wanted to equip, while also making up for the inevitable attrition and battlefield losses that comes with fighting a full-scale conventional war. Luckily for Ukraine, another key donor was about to step up. Because no country on planet Earth has a larger stockpile of Soviet or post-Soviet style equipment than Russia does. And from the 24th of February onward, Russia was determined to take a significant part of that stockpile and push it down roads into Ukraine during mud season. And they did it with all the equipment preservation instincts of the sort of person who parks a brand new Lamborghini in the worst neighbourhood imaginable. Because as the first Russian armoured vehicles bogged down, broke down or just ran out of gas, the Ukrainian farmers saw their chance. And the world was treated to images of tractors towing away armoured vehicles that in some cases might have been worth a thousand times the average Ukrainian annual salary. The internet had a new meme, but the Ukrainian military had a new source of critical resupply. Since that point, captured equipment has become an omnipresent feature on both sides of this war. And photos of soldiers posing in front of captured kit have frankly become so common that I do wonder if they haven't replaced pet photos as the most popular front pages for dating apps and social media. In some ways, it was a natural result of having a conflict in which both sides used basically the same equipment. And given the extraordinary quantities involved, I thought it deserved its own video. Firstly, what I'm going to be doing is give a little bit of an overview of how much equipment we can estimate that Ukraine has captured from the Russians and allied forces so far, at least according to the best available data we have. And I'm also going to poke some holes in that data, raise some questions around classifications, underestimation, overestimation, and try and get us closer to the point of the truth. Then I'm going to talk about the fact that just because a vehicle is found abandoned doesn't mean it automatically gets put instantly back into service with the other side. Vehicles need to be recovered, repaired, potentially cannibalized, and because I am not an expert in armoured recovery, well, I've brought in someone who is. Everyone's favourite tanker, the Chieftain. Then, after the best lecture on armoured recovery that you can get anywhere in the world, I'm going to try and put what he tells you into the Ukrainian context, looking at examples of Ukrainian recovery and repair techniques, the importance of European support, and the significance of captured equipment overall. I will note that in this video I focus mostly on heavy captured equipment and equipment that has been captured and put into use by the Ukrainians. I don't talk as much about the stuff that has been captured from the Ukrainians and put into DPR or LPR service, simply because I want to keep the video tight and also because the data is much better on Ukrainian captures than on DPR, LPR captures. As always, the usual caveats over the fog of war and data quality apply. And before we jump into it, a quick word from returning sponsor, Ground News. If you follow major international events, you'll know that accurate, unbiased news is hard to find, and that it's ever more important to break out of the echo chambers of particular coverage. Ground News is a news comparison platform that helps you do just that. It's a combination of an app and a website that allows you to instantly compare coverage for particular topics across different news outlets from around the world. So I've previously looked at this story about the so-called LPR and DPR planning to block Google in their territories. At a glance, you can see that Ground News tracks 17 sources covering this particular topic. Ground News lets you instantly switch between headline coverage, see which organizations are emphasizing what, and catch any hidden details. It lets you build a picture out of the entire media ecosystem, not just one story. And it can also let you identify broader patterns in coverage. 
Not every story is going to get the same amount of coverage everywhere on the political spectrum. And what Ground News allows you to do for every single one of the stories that they feature is to zoom in and identify potential blind spots in coverage. It's a great way to get an understanding of what's being reported on the other side of the political aisle. It also brings together a whole bunch of contextual information, whether that be the details of media ownership for particular companies, or Ground News evaluation of their historical biases or factuality ratings. Things that can provide just a little more context to coverage. There are no silver bullets in the fight for accurate information, but I think we have to try. And Ground News may be a tool that helps you see things just a little bit differently. If you're interested, there's a link to check out in the description, ground.news slash Perun. As is so often the case, I find myself coming back once again to the ill-fated initial Russian attack on the city of Kyiv. This was the front of advance that faced the most obvious logistical difficulties. This was the front which produced the most images of vehicles bogging down in the mud or left abandoned after breaking down or running out of fuel. This was the front where units were the most overextended, the most vulnerable to ambushes and where the supply lines were under the most threat. And this was the front where, at the end of a long road through such scenic locations as the Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, let's all remember that one, was the city of Kyiv, packed with several million Ukrainians, many of whom were determined to resist. Now, the Northern Front wasn't unique in terms of logistical challenges. Poor maintenance, poor logistics and corruption meant that anywhere the Russian army went, there was always a danger of breakdowns or vehicles running out of fuel. The difference was here in Kyiv, unlike in the south where they advanced relatively quickly, or in the east where the fighting was positional from the very start, in Kyiv they initially advanced and then eventually realised that they would be forced to give up the ground that they had taken. The Russian Ministry of Defence would declare that as a gesture of goodwill, Russia would withdraw its combat forces from the northern sector around the city of Kyiv, and they would leave a lot of stuff behind. Now, Ukrainian efforts to capture or recover abandoned Russian equipment had been ongoing from the very beginning, make no mistake. After all, if you are a farmer and you see an abandoned tank just waiting to be repurposed, are you a true Slav if you don't immediately attempt to tow the thing away? But generally speaking, it's easier to operate once opposing forces are out of the area. So once Russia withdrew, leaving behind their equipment, well, at that point, the documentation and recovery of captured equipment could begin in earnest. Between the mud, breakdowns, poor logistics and the eventual Russian withdrawal, the offensive against Kyiv and on the northern front would account for a shockingly disproportionate share of vehicles captured or abandoned to the Ukrainians over the course of the war. While later heavy fighting in the Donbass would account for very large numbers of vehicles destroyed on both sides, it would be this initial offensive in the north, battles at places like Kyiv or Trostyanets, that would account for a disproportionate share of all of the equipment that Ukraine would capture from the Russians. It was a bountiful harvest at exactly the time that Ukraine needed an influx of new material. And Ukrainian military units would make use of this stuff on a large scale. But by June and July, they would be confessing that the rate of captures had gone down, and as a result, many units were starting to face supply problems yet again. Gone, it seemed, were the days when the Russians would just leave a $25 million air defence system or a perfectly fine and operable tank abandoned or bogged down by the side of the road. At least that was until the Kharkiv counteroffensive kicked off. Because in many ways, the Kharkiv counteroffensive had the same characteristics of the Russian withdrawal from Kyiv. A rapid withdrawal of Russian forces, which meant a whole bunch of kit got left behind. And here I'd like to credit the work of Ragnar Biatr, who is an Icelandic data analyst on Twitter, who's taken the Oryx data and created a number of dashboards about the Kharkiv counteroffensive. His work is there on the right-hand side of the screen. And Kharkiv was impressive in three ways. Firstly, the amount of territory retaken, but secondly, the amount of equipment lost by the Russians, and thirdly, how much of it was captured or abandoned. Overall, visually confirmed, there were 846 Russian vehicles lost in the Kharkiv counteroffensive between the 29th of August and the 20th of September including a casual 172 tanks and 44 self-propelled artillery pieces, meaning the Russians had lost the Australian Armoured Corps several times over. But perhaps even more important from a Ukrainian perspective was the share of that equipment that was captured. Overall, for the war to date, about 30% of Russian equipment losses that have been visually confirmed are vehicles that are marked as being captured. During the Kharkiv counteroffensive, it was 54.5%. It included 92 captured tanks. 125 captured infantry fighting vehicles, and 30 captured self-propelled guns. Again, even if Australia agreed to hand over every tank we have to Ukraine, 
it wouldn't be enough to match the number of tanks that are visually confirmed to have been captured from the Russians by the Ukrainians in around three weeks of the Kharkiv counteroffensive. And that's just the ones that we have photographic evidence of. And when you start bringing in visually confirmed loss stats for the entire conflict, well, I can understand where people get the idea that Russia is Ukraine's primary arms supplier. Over the course of the conflict, we have proof of Russia losing about 1,155 tanks, of which 382 were captured, 601 AFEs, of which 170 were captured, 204 engineering vehicles, 81 captured, 207 self-propelled guns, of which 82 captured. The list is there. Overall, 6,202 pieces of military equipment, of which 1,911 are marked as captured. And unfortunately, this is where a lot of the analysis on this topic I see stops. They say that we have 382 photos of Ukrainians flashing the V for victory sign while standing on captured Russian tanks. Therefore, Ukraine has captured and put into service 382 Russian tanks, and we should do all analysis on that basis. Unfortunately, I think it goes a little bit deeper than that. So let's have a little bit of a closer look at the data and also what is involved in recovery and repair. Because I guarantee that one of the first comments on this video is going to be that my data is wrong, that these are Western propaganda numbers. So it's important to look at the data, understand it, understand other sources that are out there, so that I can be transparent about the numbers I'm using and how I should interpret them. Generally speaking, when you're looking at detailed vehicle loss statistics, there are three main sources out there. The Russian Ministry of Defense, the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense, and a family of open source intelligence aggregators out on the internet who build estimates based on visual evidence of captures or destroyed vehicles that they can bring together. There's also a fourth category, uh, random hot takes on Twitter and Telegram, but I tend to discount those. I also generally tend to discard the Ministry of Defense claims as well. As I've talked about before, Russian kill claims in this conflict are comical. They have destroyed the entire Ukrainian Air Force several times over, for example. And while the Ukrainian numbers seem generally more reasonable, they still show signs of large-scale overclaiming in categories like aircraft. Plus, they don't break down vehicles between destroyed, abandoned, damaged, or captured the way we need to do for this sort of analysis. And so we use open source lists instead. Oryx is the most famous one for compiling equipment losses. Basically, what these lists do is individuals submit images that they have found or taken themselves of destroyed or captured equipment. They submit those the umpires and operators of those lists check them to see whether or not they're duplicates of existing equipment, and then they post that image to their list and update their count of estimated destroyed equipment. This is not a perfect process. There are reasons you might have both overestimates and underestimates built in. For example, a list could hypothetically overcount the number of vehicles involved if there are fake captures. The Russians allege, for example, that the Ukrainians take Ukrainian hardware, paint it in Russian colors, put a big Z on the side, and then submit a photo claiming to have captured the vehicle. More innocently, you can have situations where multiple parties photograph the same piece of equipment, maybe from different angles, and if the umpires get confused or they miss it, maybe the same vehicle gets counted twice. It's for that reason that on some days you'll actually see the number of claimed kills go down as individuals go through the list, identify duplicates, and remove them. Verification is a time-intensive task, so my hat absolutely goes off to the guys who are currently running the Oryx list, particularly Mr. Yanovsky, who posts the lists every day. But there are also reasons that these lists would undercount. The number one reason is they're dependent on someone taking a photo of the thing. And when you're in combat, there's a lot of circumstances where you have other things on your mind than grabbing out a camera or your phone and taking a happy snap of something you just claim to have destroyed. Plus, there are circumstances where taking a photograph just isn't possible in the first place. HIMARS strikes, for example, are usually not drone corrected. They're not filmed, so we don't see images when HIMARS rockets land on a target and destroy, for example, a collection of vehicles in a repair depot unless the Russians go out and photograph it for us, which has happened in at least one occasion. Airstrikes usually won't be photographed and produce visual evidence. Vehicles destroyed beyond visual range or with indirect fire that doesn't happen to be captured by a drone, which happens to be driven by a pilot who feels like uploading the footage to the internet, well, all of these things are going to go without photography or video evidence. And so I would generally take the view that these sort of lists are more likely to undercount on net than overcount. That it is more likely that things don't get photographed or videoed at all, or at least if they are photographed and videoed, they may not be uploaded, than it is for either side to go to immense effort trying to fake destroyed or captured vehicles on enough scale to compensate for it. So as I go through these losses, 
Remember the numbers are probably conservative. The second issue, other than just the numbers potentially being too high or too low, is that classification is very difficult. The Oryx list classifies equipment as either captured, abandoned, damaged, or destroyed. This is a relatively simple rule. If there's some sign, say Ukrainian soldiers climbing over a tank, then the tank can be assumed to be captured. If by contrast, the tank appears to have thrown its turret into low earth orbit, then it is usually classified as destroyed. But while these seem to be clear lines in some sense, they can sometimes get a little bit difficult. For example, that tank in the top right hand corner there was classified as abandoned. It is in a fighting position with no visible Russians. The snow buildup over the engine compartment suggests the thing hasn't run in a while, but there's no Ukrainians in the photo and there's no idea what happens to this position later on. Potentially the Russians retake the position, potentially the Ukrainians took it and recovered the vehicle. This vehicle may be back in Russian service, or it may have become a Ukrainian capture, it's difficult to know. In the bottom right you have an example of a damaged vehicle. The tank has been beat up significantly. But we don't know whether or not that vehicle is able to, for example, undergo a factory rebuild in rear areas and become a serviceable tank. Or can spare parts be pulled from the thing in order to get other tanks operational? Damage is a sliding scale, and it's hard to know from the one or two images we often have whether or not a vehicle is a complete write-off, or a potentially useful source of parts, or may even go back into service itself. And that segues into perhaps my most important issue with these statistics. It doesn't really matter how many Russian vehicles provide new profile pictures to Ukrainians who are flying flags standing triumphantly over them. What matters instead is how many of these vehicles are able to be put back into service, how many can actually be used by the Ukrainian military or salvaged for parts. It's all well and good to provide images of, say, for example, six Russian tanks abandoned by the road, but it makes all the difference in the world as to whether or not the Ukrainians will simply strip them of their machine guns, ERA plates, and then leave them there to rust, or if they'll be able to drag them to rear areas, go through repairs, and eventually put the things back into service. And that whole process of recovery and repair is a fairly involved one, and also one that goes beyond my area of expertise. I try very hard on this channel to stay in my lane. I'm very comfortable talking about defense economics, but I wouldn't have the first idea of how to get a tank out of a ditch. Most of you will know YouTube's resident tank commander, Nicholas Moran, as the chieftain, and he's kindly agreed to come along today and give us a bit of a primer, because when it comes to understanding just what is involved in recovering and repairing an armored vehicle in a combat zone, it kind of helps to have commanded a tank or an armored vehicle in a combat zone. So I'm gonna disappear for a moment and let him speak, but not before recommending his channel for anyone who wants to learn everything there is to know about tanks and armored vehicles. See you again shortly. Greetings all. Okay, thanks to Peron for thinking of me. And I know you're all here for the PowerPoint, not a talking head. So I'll tell you now, unlike most of my videos, I will not be putting up any imagery. So as I'm saying things, feel free to alt tab out, bring up your search engine of choice and do a little additional research to sate any curiosity I may spark. All right, let's talk BDAR. I'm sure the Russians and Ukrainians have their own term for it, but it's battle damage assessment and repair. I'm going to focus on the process mainly from the US perspective, since it's what I'm familiar with, and because the regulations are publicly available and in English, so I can reference them. If you wish to peruse them yourself, let's start with ATP 4-31. There's like your first alt tab option. I'll be covering some of the Russian quirks as well, but the American process should give you a grounding on basic concepts. The following should apply both to friendly vehicles and those captured from the enemy. Closely related to BDAR is recovery. Both repair and recovery will depend a little bit on how the battle is going. Generally speaking, decide which one the battle will have the advantage of being able to recover the equipment, if repair in place is not possible. If the battle is still ongoing, things get a little bit more difficult. The first thing for the crew to do, obviously once it's safe enough to do it, is to attempt self-recovery. The idea between the three levels of recovery is to limit the call on recovery assets. There are only so many ARVs, armored recovery vehicles, go around, after all. Basically, self-recovery is the crew using the troubleshooting procedures in the manual combined with any tools that they may happen to have on hand to get themselves back into motion. A stereotypical example will be a broken track, which requires link replacement, as any tank should have its own tools and a couple of spare parts. Emphasis on should, by the way. Uh, the way the Russians seem to have had all sorts of things stolen or sold, one may legitimately ask if each tank has a complete set of BII. BII is basic issue items. 
Commonwealth folks may know it as the CES, uh, the Common Equipment Schedule or Schedule. But basically, it's all the tools and equipment that is supposed to go on the tank. If your track jacks are missing, you are not going to get your tank moving again until they can flag down somebody who has a set. Sometimes the problems can be really, really simple, such as you know, the T-handle for the fuel flow cutoff being loose and working its way out. It all counts as self-recovery. One can even self-recover from basic miring, such as by use of a log between the tracks, or even using the tracks themselves as a winch. Many of these techniques are not taught to crewmen in school. It's more of a on-the-job experience thing during exercises, and then it's handed down from senior NCO to junior, or else you just have the occasional weirdo who reads the recovery manual for fun. If you are an army which doesn't train hard on its equipment, you may have less such institutional knowledge simply due to a lack of experience. It's the sort of training that even the best simulators cannot impart. If self-recovery is not possible, the next level is like vehicle recovery, which is defined as using the same or heavier weight class of vehicle, with the one exception that the manual is very specific that tracked vehicles cannot tow wheeled vehicles because it damages their steering. So there are a couple of levels here. One is that the vehicle is just plain stuck, but otherwise functional. So all you need to do is get the thing out of the ditch or mud hole or whatever that it's in. That's where the tow cables come in. You've seen them, big steel cables with a little loop on the end. They're not really designed to haul vehicles a long distance. Their advantage over a tow bar is that they are very, very quick to hook up. And indeed, if you look at the default stowage on a T-72, you'll see that the tow cables are stowed with one end pretty much already hooked up to the tank's tow hook. So one chap just needs to hop out, hook the other end of the, the two one-ended cables, and hop back into the tank. So you want to hop back in, by the way, in case the cable snaps. It's, not a good thing. Uh, plus, of course, there is less danger from hot metal flying around on the battlefield. So yeah, then you're hooked up, you haul the tank out, chap unhooks, restows the two loose ends of the two cables, and everybody gets back into the fight. Cables don't have to be kept on the official stowage position either. So the M1, for example, officially stows its cables on the turret sides, but we ran, we ran them on the hull. One end pre-hooked to the front and rear, similar to T-72. Like vehicle recoveries can be fairly impressive. A tank rolled on its side, for example, can be like recovered. It takes three other tanks to do it, but you don't need to call for a recovery vehicle. The next level of like recovery is to basically get out of the immediate hostile zone. So basically what you're doing is you're dragging the tank back one terrain feature. The manual says up to a kilometer. Further distances are possible, but if you're going to be dragging a tank with another tank any particular distance, you may need a brake tank to stop the towed tank from slamming into the towing one. Soviet-designed tanks, though, do have one advantage here. To tow most tracked vehicles any distance, you need to disconnect the final drives. It usually doesn't take too long, two or three minutes for a reasonable design. It disconnects the sprockets from the final drives, which are connected to the steering and braking system, which then connects to the transmission. Putting the transmission in neutral does nothing to reduce the stress on those other components, hence the requirement to disconnect the sprockets. However, since in T-72, for example, the two transmissions are the steering system, putting the tank in neutral legitimately will suffice, which means that the brakes on the tank will still work. Only applies for that design of system, though. Other vehicles, such as PCs and SPGs, will probably have a more typical layout, which, if you don't want to damage your powertrain, requires you to disconnect it and the brakes before any lengthy tow. If you do have to do a long tow, well, that's what tow bars are for. And these are basically A-frames and can provide much better control of steering and braking. Finally, there is dedicated recovery. This is your third level, so you've got self-recovery, light vehicle, and dedicated. The troops in question have so, done such an awesome job that there is nothing for it but the calling for a specialized vehicle, usually with an array of winches, tackles, and lifting gear to get them out of whatever hole they got themselves into. The BDAR manual has some fairly interesting diagrams of how to hook up anchors, blocks, etc., in order to get vehicles out of places that they would have been better off avoiding. So just how far are you supposed to tow the thing if it genuinely will not roll on its own power, and the contact team at the front line can't get it operating again? You can expect that a battalion will have a maintenance collection point. 
Something that both Russian and American concepts agree with is that as much as possible, repairs and maintenance should happen near the front, although there are a couple of differences in the detail. If you're old school American, you will remember the four levels of maintenance support, and now it's just two, field and sustainment. Russia also operates, in general, upon this two-level principle. Russian equipment tries to work on the basis of making its equipment soldier-proof to begin with. It does not have the same level of parts supplies, as perhaps we might consider to be default in the West. Thus, to quote Emmanuel, up for stresses, preventive maintenance, technical inspections, and proper operating methods to extend the life cycle of the equipment, unquote. Now, whether or not this has been followed in lights of event in Ukraine is an open question. The stuff is supposed to be rugged. If the soldiers can't break it, it won't need repair. Well, that's the theory. However, given the number of vehicles found to have been abandoned, it is a fair question as to whether or not the vehicles actually do need much repair. Perhaps they just genuinely were stuck and operating, or ran out of fuel, or whatever. Or perhaps at worst it was a simple breakage caused by a lack of maintenance. In any case, let's assume that the vehicle is now in a place that the maintainers can have a solid look at it. Either it's where it was found on the battlefield, now controlled by that side, or it has been towed to a maintenance collection point. The first thing to do is to make an assessment, starting with, is this thing going to kill me? Abandoned vehicles may be booby-trapped, or they may have demolitions which hang fired. The next step is to figure out what, if anything, is damaged, and what, if anything, is not working. And this is where familiarity with the system in question is useful. It can be as simple as identifying a tripped circuit breaker, but in this context, it's much easier to assess a known vehicle than an unknown one. For example, it would not be too hard for a Ukrainian maintainer to run a full assessment of the systems of a Russian T-72, even if they're not identical to a T-64 or even a Ukrainian T-72, it should be close enough to figure out. If a Russian maintainer started to evaluate, say, a Gepard, um, he'd probably have to start from basic principles. So here, the simpler the vehicle in question, the easier it is for the maintainer to perform his or her assessment. Once that is done, the next question is, just how much do we need to fix it? It's nice to think that a tank can be repaired to a fully functional configuration, but the reality is that it may not be appropriate. The US manual lists four possible status. Fully mission capable, combat capable, which means it can at least shoot, move, and communicate to a basic level. Combat emergency capable, which means that the thing can be used in a pinch, but runs the risk of becoming even more damaged just by its use. And non-mission capable, which means that the thing can't be used at all. So, for the sake of the example, let's say the Ukrainians have captured a T-72B3, which ran out of fuel, but also the gunner's thermal sight is inoperative. It's not fully mission capable, but it is combat capable. Should the maintainer just put fuel into it and dispatch it to a using unit? Or should he wait to see if a thermal site can be procured? Prioritization questions like that are a matter for commanders. The thermal site is a major force multiplier, but on the other hand, a good enough tank may be needed more right now. Sometimes the vehicle can be brought back into an acceptable status by way of expedient repairs. An expedient repair is what you might call a bodge job. It's temporary, but it gets the job done for now. An example given in the manual is duct taping armor in place. The manual states that most expedient repairs aren't going to be in any manual, and that flexibility and ingenuity are key. Sometimes the bodging can be enhanced by fabrication, a machine shop, to, to include one in the field, making or modifying a part to become good enough for installation. There are interesting developments in the realm of 3D printing as well, but I think it's safe to assume that neither party in the Ukraine conflict is quite there yet. Anyway, any expedient repair has a risk factor associated with it. High risk is something which may damage the vehicle or cause injury to personnel. You know, the, the repaired turret traverse system should work, but if the repair fails, there's a good chance of the system exploding and the crew compartment catching a fire, you know, that sort of thing. A moderate risk is something which causes uh, increased damage to the equipment if it fails, but it isn't likely to threaten the crew. And the example given in the manual is the fix on a coolant leak. If it fails, the engine could overheat and be damaged. And there's low risk, which 
even if it fails, is more of an annoyance needing fixing than anything more serious. So again, the commander needs to make a judgment call as to just how badly he needs the equipment to be back in operation and how much he's willing to risk in order to attain that. Again, this is the sort of decision making which is invisible to us watching news reports on the internet. When a tank is returned to the front line, and you know, we see it announced on Twitter or whatever, we have no clue whether it's a bodge job or a thorough repair. Expedient repairs, even low-risk ones, are officially temporary and are used only pending replacement or repair by approved materials or components. Thus, it is important to record any expedient repairs for future rectification, otherwise it'll just eventually break. Quite which parts are replaced by whom will vary. Russia categorizes its repairs as routine, medium, or capital. Routine repairs are the sort of thing conducted at a battalion or company level. You know, replacing a searchlight, swapping out a transmission unit, replacing a torsion bar. These repairs require limited mechanical or engineering skill. Just follow the manual step by step and you should be good. Medium repairs are usually done at a higher level. Uh, that transmission unit which was pulled out as a routine repair needs to be opened up and a cog replaced, you know, whatever, something like that. This requires greater technical knowledge. In Soviet times, yeah, maybe even an officer would be required. And this is likely to point to greatest difference between the Russian and American practices. Field maintenance companies at the brigade level, pushed forward to battalion, should be capable of doing this sort of thing in the US system. Again, those familiar with the old four level system may understand when I say that about two thirds of the old 30 level tasks are now categorized as field maintenance and ATP 4-33 states that the forward support company personnel at the battalion level, MCP, maintenance collection point, should be capable of conducting all field level maintenance tasks. Think about that. That's two thirds of the old 30 level tasking now done at battalion level. Capital repairs are things which require major component rebuild and are only done at depots. In today's US system, it would fall under the sustainment maintenance level. That's not to say that there aren't higher levels of field repair. A brigade will have its own maintenance collection point, but that is as much of equipment which will take too long to repair a battalion or which needs sustainment level work. So what does that mean for a Ukrainian or Russian repair shop? Basically, the majority of repairs of recovered equipment will be either bodging it to an acceptable standard or replacing components with working ones. The systems likely are not set up for large scale repair of damaged components. Now, I'm not going to say that a damaged transmission is going to be chucked into the scrap heap, but repairing those components is not going to be something that many of the field repair shops are going to be equipped for. And neither, I might observe, perhaps they don't have the time for it. Again, remember how I mentioned that recovery and maintenance assets are always scarce and to be husbanded, and that includes simple man hours. Again, from the manual, there is a reference to equipment triage. Quote, Personnel base this determination on combat or sustainment equipment, time, urgency, materials, and personnel required to do the required repairs. Put simply, it's a judgment call. There is no hard and fast rule. Should that repair shop spend six hours opening up that T-72 transmission? Or should it spend six hours fixing three other T-72s, after which perhaps a couple of BMPs will be delivered for repair? My estimate is that, and again, this is estimate here, in practice, most of these Ukrainian repair shops are really to the level of field maintenance under US standards. Remember, even a turret lift is something which can be done by an M88 in the US system. It's why the Americans get with the A-frame on the recovery vehicle instead of a crane. Abrams turrets are some of the heaviest turrets out there. Ukraine absolutely does have the ability for depot level maintenance, but that should be reserved only for the most significant rebuilds or upgrades. So, if I continue on the assumption that neither Ukraine nor Russia is really doing a whole heck of a lot of component repair, except as time available and triage allows, the question becomes, where do you get the replacement components? Ukraine obviously isn't getting deliveries in from Russia for Russian vehicles, and frankly even Russia is having its own parts supply problems together with all the other supply problems it's facing. That said, bear in mind the astonishingly high percentage of vehicles which were found abandoned as opposed to being knocked out by battle damage. 
Component level replacement may be all that is required for much of it. So I'm going to introduce the last two American terms for this segment, you know, again, whatever they call them elsewhere. Controlled exchange and cannibalization. Cannibalization is easy, that's finding a vehicle which is damaged beyond viable repair and trying to see if there are any components left usable on it. So if the tank burned up in the crew compartment, the transmission might still be usable, or the sprocket wheel, or the radio antenna, you know, whatever. The Soviets designed their vehicles with the maximum possible interchangeability of components. They assumed that there would be a few destroyed vehicles on the battlefield here and there. If necessary, you can run a T-72 on T-55 wheels, for example, the hubs are compatible. Where the salvage occurs will depend a little bit on assets available. The easiest solution is you just drag all the captured vehicles to a central pick and pull. Uh, but sometimes crawling on a vehicle in place may be more efficient. However, even cannibalization requires rep record keeping. The piece that it replaced still broke, and those breakage numbers are of use when anticipating future demand. Controlled exchange is a little bit more involved in the US system. That requires pulling apart from an otherwise repairable vehicle in order to make a second vehicle operable. And importantly, you need to put the broken part in or on the donor vehicle, which now has to have that added to the repair requirements list. Now this is where you start getting into the idea that wars are won by statistics and industry. In theory, every spare part for every unit has an issue priority designator. Basically, how long is acceptable to get the spare part to a unit? A tank's firing pin might have a much higher priority than a stowage pin. The exchange is authorized if the amount of time it would take to get a replacement is longer than the amount of time the regulation says it should take. See AR 750-1. So let's say it's supposed to take two days to get a new transmission and you've already used all of your on-hand spares. The system assumes so many spares are required to keep a unit combat effective over a set amount of time and that a tank down for up to two days for it is acceptable in the grand scheme of things because of other available replacement tanks or whatever. If the system is screwed up, though, and you can't get the part in on schedule, then the commander can authorize an exchange so that the vehicle can be back in action within the statistically acceptable time constraints. The reason you wouldn't want to go with the exchange immediately is because it's inefficient to pull out a part twice. And that's time that the mechanics could be spending doing everything else, which the estimators think they will need to be doing to keep the unit at an acceptable level of capability. Now, one can argue that this can get a bit silly, as the earlier mentioned tank main gun firing pins can be swapped out in under five minutes. You know, the guys will probably be spending more time doing the paperwork than the exchange. But on the other hand, that's also the sort of thing which likely has a number of spare parts on hand and because they're not exactly large. However, when we're talking about national level war, it comes down to mathematics and statistics. Those outliers get subsumed in the larger calculations. Just how much the current combatants are following such a controlled exchange procedure, if at all, is an open question. Uh, but again, it comes down to efficiency. Do they really need that one T-72 repaired today by taking that other tank's component and have the other one back up and running next week? Total cost of 60 man hours? Or is there enough time in the system to wait for the various parts to show up, get the T-72 running in three days, and the other next week at a total cost of 40 man hours? because now you only have to move components once. Great, I hope you have gotten a general gasp, gasp, grasp, of recovery and repair operations, but you may be surprised by it as well, hence the gasp. Anyway, I now return you to Miltube's best PowerPoints. Okay, so with that primer done, let's start looking at the evidence of how the Ukrainians are actually tackling those challenges on the battlefield, starting with the question of recovery. As you might expect, from the limited visual evidence we have available, self and like vehicle recovery are the two most common options when we see the Ukrainians actually recovering damaged vehicles, be they captured or friendly. Most commonly, this seems to take the form when you're talking about like vehicle recovery of things like BMPs dragging BMPs or tanks being used to drag tanks. In some cases though, no relocation seems to be necessary. There are a number of videos that have come out of the Kharkiv counteroffensive where Ukrainian crews have approached T-80s that were left behind by the Russians and gotten them running in place. That suggests either the vehicle was disabled by, for example, a lack of fuel and was easily gotten running again, or that there was involved repair work that happened off camera, 
or that the vehicle was simply abandoned in running order, although I think it's fair to say that none of those options really cover the retreating Russian units in glory. Of course, like vehicle recovery involves dedicating another vehicle to the task, and recovery in place may not always be possible, and so we see the Ukrainians being a little bit creative in their use of civilian vehicles in a number of cases. We see BMPs, MTLBs, and lighter vehicles often being dragged by lighter vehicles, like trucks. And then, of course, there is everyone's favourite, the Tractor Brigade. And I originally titled this slide the application of civilian recovery assets before I figured that was pretty boring. In some ways, Ukraine as a country was built for armoured recovery. The country has a large agricultural sector, which means there are a lot of tractors to go around. And the humble tractor may not be a dedicated armoured recovery vehicle, but it is designed to tow light loads over farmland, which, if you're recovering something like an MTLB or a BMP, may be exactly what the doctor ordered. And then there's the farmers themselves. These are people who are going to know how to rig a tow. These are people for whom, especially the older generation, people like my grandpa, for whom the ability to do basic mechanical repairs wasn't just a useful vocational skill, it was a survival skill. And then I would humbly suggest... There is the cultural predisposition to take anything that is abandoned and instantly repurpose it. I mean, we sometimes joke that for my grandpa, the happiest time of year is hard rubbish collection, because inevitably someone on the street will leave out a broken appliance, like a washing machine or something, and within an hour he'll have it in his backyard disassembled and have used it to repair three other things. Farmers in these countries are not the sort of people who are quick to throw stuff away. So when they see an abandoned Russian armoured vehicle, the first instinct is always going to be, well... Go grab a tow and see if you can make some use of the damn thing. So while they may sometimes complain when the Ukrainian army or territorial defence forces take their captured Russian armoured vehicles away from them, civilian personnel in Ukraine are clearly making a difference. They're auxiliary armoured recovery assets. And we've seen examples that are being used both for short distance recovery, which is usually where the tractors come in, but also using civilian moving trucks and flatbeds to move armoured vehicles longer distances, presumably to places like repair depots or to railheads. And all of this is significant from an economy of resource point of view. You don't need a BMP to tow away a BMP in this scenario. You can keep fighting with the one you have. You don't need to call in a specialised armoured recovery vehicle. Save that for the particularly difficult cases. If you can solve a problem with the application of farmers and tractors and flatbed trucks, well then Ukraine is going to do it because it has an awful lot more farmers, tractors and flatbed trucks than it does dedicated armoured recovery vehicles. So we can laugh and meme on this point all we want, but when we have images of tractors towing away $25 million Tor surface-to-air missile systems that no other country in Europe is in a position to resupply Ukraine with, well, that's no laughing matter. That's a critical contribution to national security. But there are surely cases where a tractor just isn't going to cut it. Some systems are very heavy, sometimes there's difficult terrain involved, and there's no choice other than to bring in a specialised recovery vehicle, as the chieftain said. Ukraine didn't start the war with particularly many dedicated recovery vehicles. There are a bit more than 12 of the BREM type, which is based on a T-72 chassis. But since the war began, it's confirmed visually to have captured 15 further examples of this type from the Russians. Although even that may not have been enough, because the call seems to have gone out to Western allies for more dedicated recovery vehicles. While Germany hasn't been willing to provide Leopards or Martyrs, main battle tanks or infantry fighting vehicles, it has been willing to provide armoured recovery vehicles. 15 German ARVs have been provided to Ukraine from August onwards, more than doubling the initial Ukrainian asset list. It does sometimes seem like the compromise position reached by Germany is that it's not willing to provide MBTs, but absolutely willing to give Ukraine vehicles to recover its own or to steal from the Russians. So that's some observations about what we've seen of recovery in Ukraine. There does seem to be cases of light vehicle recovery and repair in place, the big difference from the manual is the extensive deployment of civilian recovery assets like tractors and trucks, as opposed to just dedicated military recovery vehicles. My next observation on where things might sometimes deviate from the manual is where equipment goes once it's been captured and recovered. Technically speaking, captured equipment should be handed over to Central Command and reallocated. It doesn't always seem in Ukraine that that is the case. Make no mistake, it does seem like a lot of equipment gets handed up to Central and then redistributed. But based on some journalistic investigations and some interviews, so hard to determine the exact frequency, there does seem to be a lot of informal procedures around captured equipment as well. After all, the Ukrainian army is still modernising. This is a largely paper-based force in a lot of ways. It still has a lot of bureaucracy and is fairly slow-moving given the conflict that it finds itself in. 
And so, as so often happens in war, an informal economy appears to have grown up between some supply officers, at least according to these interviews. Often what seems to happen is units will capture particular equipment and then they'll get on the phone and telegram and they'll barter with their surrounding units for other equipment that they might need, moving supplies laterally between units rather than up the chain back to central and then having units request equipment from central and having that flow down the supply chain. One example given in an interview, which I'll link in the description, is a unit which captured a Russian tank and decided, hey, didn't really need a Russian tank, uh, so it started shopping it around to its mates. The text message went, listen, here's the thing, we have a tank we don't need, a T-72, a little bit damaged, and we'd like to exchange it for something nice. And then over a series of text messages, the New York Times talks about how eventually a deal was negotiated. The tank would be traded for a transport truck and a couple of sniper rifles, which is what the unit that had captured the tank says they needed. In another case, a unit traded some mortars that it had captured from the Russians to another unit in exchange for the spare parts it needed to get some of its armoured vehicles running again. This is an informal supply chain. It's a lateral movement of supplies and would probably make a bunch of statisticians at headquarters want to off themselves. But anecdotally, at least, the units claim when interviewed that this is necessary to fill gaps, that it's quicker than waiting for the ordinary supply procedures to be followed and it allows captured equipment to be distributed efficiently. So far as the official position on this goes, I'm sure the practice is very heavily officially discouraged. But the observation in the article points out that while Central Command tends to be pretty heavy on making sure that equipment isn't sold to the black market or shipped out of the country, leakage as it would be called, because that would obviously endanger the war effort and ongoing supplies to Ukraine, no one really seems to ask questions as long as units are just swapping equipment between each other. Another reason that units might be so keen on capturing Russian equipment it's not just about getting equipment you need, it's about getting something that you can trade for the stuff that you need. But that only works if the equipment is in working order. If not, then we need to talk about repair. Now, it's hard to pass the balance between different types of repair being done by the Ukrainians based on just the videos and the photographs and the interviews that we have available to us. It's clear that when we're talking about the front lines, there are a lot of different approaches being taken to do what the chieftain would call expedient repairs. You have mobile recovery and repair units who are guys who cruise around in an armoured recovery unit with a bunch of spare parts and a couple of mechanics, get called to a broken down vehicle, go in, recover it and try and fix it in situ. You also have unit workshops, buildings that had civilian purposes before the war, where soldiers, particularly those with some sort of mechanical expertise or experience, are basically doing fabrication, mechanical repairs in situ. This comes back to the point that when you're doing a mass mobilisation and most importantly, you can get volunteers with technical skills, so mechanics, welders, people with experience, then you're able to staff up workshops that can do some sort of repair at a local level, or so it seems. The integration of civilian experts and civilian workshops is evident through a lot of the visual and photographic evidence that we have. But if that's a real area of strength for the Ukrainian armed forces when it comes to repair, well, things get a little bit uglier when you're talking about capital repair in the rear areas. Unlike many countries, Ukraine does have its own tank plants. It does have factories and facilities capable of repairing and refitting armoured vehicles. It also has an extensive train network that is, provided the recovery vehicles can get a vehicle to a railhead, are able to transport tanks and armoured vehicles that have been heavily damaged back to those facilities. The problem is that these tank plants are hardly secret. They were all known facilities pre-war, and as a result, they're constantly vulnerable to Russian long-range missile attack. Russia claims to have hit, for example, the Kharkiv tank plant with Iskander missiles in the month of July. And while Russian reconnaissance capabilities and targeting do seem to struggle with small targets and moving targets, tank factories aren't exactly known for their maneuverability. And so when you couple that threat of long-range missile attack with limitations of the factories themselves, it becomes clear that Ukraine really does need foreign support to do capital repairs. While any self-respecting Slav is capable of stripping the ERA and anything useful off the exterior of a tank in minutes, they do need a dedicated facility in order to do major repairs. And that's where foreign countries come in. Because while we tend to focus on the weapons, the quantity and the value of weapons shipped to Ukraine by various countries, deals to assist with things like repairs or with technical assistance tend to go relatively unnoticed. Something which is kind of silly in a way, because as far as the mathematics of war are concerned, there's no actual difference between supplying Ukraine a new T-72 and taking a heavily damaged, disabled or destroyed one that they had and putting it back into service. 
If you can turn a captured disabled Russian vehicle into a battle-ready one, well that's as good as providing one that's basically factory fresh. And here, as so many other times in this conflict, it's the former Warsaw Pact states doing the heavy lifting. A lot of these countries still do have expertise and tooling in order to repair and restore Soviet-style equipment. The first example I was able to find was an announcement by the Czechs in April that they would begin repairing Ukrainian T-64s in Czech tank factories. Poland was also extremely active, and still is. Poland is pushing for a multinational repair hub to be set up in Poland, with the idea being that whole different classes of vehicles that are damaged in Ukraine or captured from the Russians can be brought to one multinational location where technical experts and capital equipment are available to help put that equipment back into action as fast as possible. That would presumably simplify logistics, cut travel times, and help increase the throughput of repaired and restored equipment. But while I could easily spend this segment talking about Poland's role again, I instead want to call out a country that hasn't exactly been brought up that often. To call Bulgaria's political situation complex would be an understatement. We all know that Germany was highly dependent on Russian energy, but it had nothing on Bulgaria's level of dependence on Russian gas. This is a country with divergent views among the population on Russia. This is a country where companies like uh, Lukoil and Gazprom exercise significant economic influence and political power. And while I don't want to get lost in the politics, there's no doubt that the war in Ukraine has been politically disruptive in Bulgaria. The Petkov government that was previously in power fell. I'm not sure how many Western observers noted that. But the Petkov government collapsed relatively soon after it refused to pay for deliveries of hydrocarbons from Russia in rubles. This is also a country that hasn't exactly come to the forefront when it comes to donated equipment in the same way countries like Poland or the Czechs have. But Bulgaria is an important part of Ukraine's supply network. The country has opened up its shops for repair work, and 80 Ukrainian tanks are already agreed to be repaired in Bulgarian workshops. That is taking place despite the fact that Russia has retaliated in a number of ways, such as stripping Bulgarian companies of their licenses to do work on Russian equipment. As far as the harsh arithmetic of war is concerned, there is no difference between Bulgaria handing over 80 tanks and repairing 80 destroyed tanks for the Ukrainians. A tank is a tank. And then there's the fact that particularly Bulgarian ammunition just keeps mysteriously surfacing in Ukraine. Bulgaria doesn't donate ammunition. It doesn't donate mortars or weapons. It just sells them to other countries that happen to then provide them to Ukraine. Allegedly. America runs up high bills in terms of dollar values when it supplies military equipment because it's supplying things like GPS-guided rockets and HIMARS systems, things with a big dollar tag. What Bulgaria offers is not stuff that is particularly expensive, but it is stuff that Ukraine needs. Cheap as chips Soviet-era ammunition, repair services for Soviet-era equipment. This is stuff that Ukraine's allies definitely have the money to purchase. It's relatively cheap stuff. What they need is a supplier, and Bulgaria quietly, quietly has been willing to be one. The nation is going into an election in the first week of next month, and we'll see how the electorate responds to that particular approach. And if you have any doubt as to the importance of these countries in supplying Ukraine, well then I would draw your attention to mysterious explosions in ammunition depots in Bulgaria and the Czech Republic. These sort of repair and supply arrangements are critical. They allow the use of heavy equipment that is available in these countries. They allow the introduction of incidental upgrade packages. For example, if a T-72 is delivered to Poland for repairs, well, there's a number of things the Poles can do with that thing in order to jazz it up a little bit before it's shipped back to Ukraine. These facilities are also, where these repairs are being done, are also nominally beyond the reach of Russian missile attack. Russia could bomb them, but that would mean war with NATO, and that doesn't seem to be something the Russian military is up for right this second. Despite insisting that they are actually in a struggle with NATO every chance they get, I don't think Russia actually wants NATO combat troops crossing into Ukraine or Belarus. I think these deals also highlight an important point when we're discussing the supply of more advanced hardware to Ukraine. These sort of deals demonstrate that you don't need to get the Ukrainians up to speed where they can do factory-level capital repairs on all of the equipment that you provide. They don't need to be able to do full maintenance, full capital maintenance, on an M1 Abrams, for example. You can station those sort of facilities and capabilities in countries like Poland. What the Ukrainians need to be able to do is field maintenance, field repair, and if necessary, recovery and transport to a capital facility. But with all that said, it's time I get back to the core question. How much stuff has Ukraine captured? 
How are they using it and how significant is it? And I think one useful way to put this into perspective is to take the visually confirmed data on captured and abandoned equipment and put it next to a list of how much equipment Ukraine is known to have received from its Western allies in terms of tanks, APCs, IFVs, etc., focusing here mainly on heavy weapon systems because they're easier to track and more readily disclosed. In the graph in front of you, the blue bar is visually confirmed captured equipment, the orange section of each bar is abandoned equipment, which may or may not have been captured, and the grey bar is stuff known to have been supplied to Ukraine by its allies. And what you can instantly see is that for a lot of equipment categories, captured and abandoned equipment is in fact the majority source of supply. If you look at IFEs, for example, there's 393 captured, 73 abandoned, versus only 170 supplied by Ukraine's allies. When you look at something specialised, like SAM systems, it's 22 captured, 8 abandoned, and only 12 supplied by other countries. So far as tanks go, normally it looks like a majority have been captured, although I will put some notes around that data. The 300 doesn't count however many PT-91s that Poland has shipped across the border. It could be 5, it could be 200, it's hard to know. And it brings home the fact that yes, a lot of this data is interesting, but it continues to be somewhat uncertain. What does seem to be clear is that there are some categories where Ukraine is actually very dependent on captured material. Surface to air missiles, command vehicles, engineering vehicles, IFEs, and others where it is highly dependent on resupply from other countries particularly when it comes to artillery systems. And that makes sense, right? Artillery systems should be behind the lines. Your enemy shouldn't be overrunning and capturing them. If they are, you've either done something horribly, horribly wrong, or it's the Kharkiv counteroffensive. And if you want to confirm those very significant capture numbers, you need to look at evidence of the Ukrainians actually using this stuff in the field. And we have that in spades. Some units anecdotally, when interviewed, report very high percentages of Russian equipment in use. Some were saying up to 80% of their heavy equipment is in fact stuff that they've captured from the Russians. A good example of this might be the Ukrainian 93rd Mechanized Brigade. I got an image of them on the top right there. These guys have had multiple encounters with 1st Guards Tank Army. They were engaged in heavy fighting with 4th Guards Tank Division at Trostyanets early in the war, and then they were one of the units involved in the Kharkiv counteroffensive that moved into Izium. You'll remember from last episode that 1st Guards Tank Army is a supposedly elite formation of the Russian army. Figures like Scott Ritter are on record early in the war fawning over this unit's offensive capabilities, and of course they have a very large number of T-80s on their equipment roster. Now, as a result of all of these encounters, 93rd Mechanized now operates a very large number of former 1st GTA T-80s. The unit essentially starts to resemble the sort of Russian units that it's engaging, representing the fact that it's absorbing more and more enemy equipment, while also losing some of its own equipment to attrition and combat damage. And while I'll often see pro-Russian commentators claim that this isn't actually captured equipment, they're just pretending it's captured equipment, we have a lot of evidence of the Ukrainians deploying equipment that they did not have in service before this war began. So it's quite obviously either Russian equipment or, I don't know, America has secretly built a T-90 factory somewhere on the American mainland and have been secretly shipping to the Ukraine. I don't know. The evidence would seem to suggest that the Ukrainians are using captured equipment on a large scale. I'll also add one addendum to this slide at time of recording that has only occurred after I've written these slides. A number of Russian sources commenting on the Kharkiv counteroffensive are saying that Ukrainian units at the front line are deploying a lot of the equipment that was left behind by the Russians, specifically T-72s, in order to both fend off Russian counterattacks and make further gains as part of the offensive. In other words, the Russians are saying that a lot of the kit they left behind has, even within a couple of days, been brought back into service and is now being used by the units that were part of the attack on the Ukrainian side in order to help maintain the momentum of the offensive. When even Russian sources are pointing out that this is a serious problem, that the Ukrainians are very good at repurposing captured equipment, I'm relatively confident saying this is happening on a significant scale. Beyond tanks and heavy vehicles, we've got a lot of evidence of captured equipment and smaller items being put into use, especially after things like the Kharkiv counteroffensive, number of ammunition depots and stockpiles appear to have been taken intact. I've got a couple of images there, 125mm ammo, grad rockets, you name it, we've got visual evidence of it. This is important because... Ukraine is always going to be short on ammunition to supply its Soviet-style systems. There are some very, very important production efforts happening right now in Eastern and Central Europe. Countries like Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, and once again the Czechs 
are very important in assuring some degree of resupply for Soviet calibers. But at the same time, captured equipment and particularly captured ammunition is important to sustaining Ukrainian capabilities. I will, however, sound one note of caution. While the Ukrainians have released images of some ammunition captures, the sort of depots that we've seen photos of, while they look impressive, aren't actually that large compared to the sort of consumption rates that you'd expect for these sort of munitions. There are certainly claims and rumours that much larger ammunition stocks have been taken, and some Russian sources have complained that ammunition wasn't destroyed before they retreated, but as yet we do not have visual evidence on any captures on the sort of scale that would be necessary to make up for large-scale consumption of something like 152mm ammo. So on that note, I'd probably say it's highly uncertain just how much ammunition Ukraine has been capturing recently and what its military significance is. An area with slightly higher certainty are specialised systems. Anti-aircraft systems are probably a good example here. It's demonstrated that the Russian Air Force does fear Ukrainian anti-air capabilities. The fact they fly so close to the deck, the fact they don't tend to fly missions deep into Ukraine, suggests that they are deeply fearful of Ukrainian anti-aircraft coverage. After a brief period in the early war where Russian jamming was very effective at shutting down Ukrainian positions. We've also got a good base of evidence to conclude that Ukraine does continue to shoot down incoming Russian cruise missiles a lot of the time, and that there is a limited possibility that Ukraine has received foreign resupply. They've received an awful lot of man pads, a few S-300 systems, some short-range air defences like the Gepard, and they're slated to get NASMs, but for the most part the sources of potential resupply for anti-aircraft, major anti-aircraft equipment for the Ukrainians is relatively limited. In that context, the capture of Russian systems, so Buk, Tor, Pansir, Osa, those are of some significance. And even when the vehicles are destroyed or disabled, where you see images of vehicles that are bogged down but they still have their missiles undamaged in their racks, well that's significant too, because you've got a potential supply of ammunition and spare parts to the other system that Ukraine does have in surface. So while the number of captured anti-air missile systems, be they books or tours, has been much, much less than the number of BMPs or tanks that Ukraine has captured, they fill a niche that Ukraine's Western allies find very difficult to fill, and they do have a degree of significance as a result. I'm relatively confident that the Russian Air Force pilots would have, let's say, relatively direct words for their army colleagues that insist on leaving this equipment behind for the Ukrainians, seemingly intact. And speaking of stuff that they really shouldn't have left behind intact, let's talk about some of the more sensitive and secretive items that Russia insists on leaving behind to be captured by the Ukrainians. And the first great example of this came out in March. And you might be going, Perun, why on earth are you so excited about what looks like a shipping container? Well, my friends, that's because that's not a shipping container. That's part of the Russian Krasuka 4 complex. It's a highly advanced electronic warfare and jamming system capable of targeting drones, radar systems, and allegedly reaching out and touching targets as distant as low Earth orbit. Now, as you can imagine, abandoning advanced jamming hardware to the enemy is a big no-no. That's the number one way to give your enemy a big leg up when he's finding ways to counter your jamming systems. And yet, back in March, someone allegedly decided to leave this system behind with the most half assed camouflage job I have ever seen. It was claimed to be on its way to the United States relatively soon afterwards. I'm imagining someone in the Russian army probably got fired over this one. Although whatever punishment they put in place clearly wasn't enough to stop people from doing it again. Some time ago, a Sukhoi 30 SM crashed in Russian-occupied territory. But no one bothered to go clear the crash site, which meant when Ukraine cleared out the area during the Kharkiv counteroffensive, the thing still had its jamming pod attached. That jamming pod on the top right there has a very important job, keeping the aircraft it is attached to alive. Now, I'm not a betting man, but I'd put dollars down on that thing being in the United States by now as well. And then there's another example in the bottom right, a Zupark 1M counter-battery complex. Now, this is not a particularly secret or sensitive vehicle. I include it to demonstrate something that really boggles the mind. The inside of this vehicle is full of screens and sensitive electronics. There's nothing really explosive inside. And yet it's just been left there. There's no evidence that anyone tried to smash up the electronics. It hasn't been fired on. It hasn't even been bashed with an elbow or the butt of a rifle. Instead, kit is just being left behind, undamaged and in working order, either to be used by the Ukrainians or to be passed off to Uncle Sam and friends. 
And then finally, I'm sure all the tank nerds out there wanted me to mention T90M. For those of you out there who are not tank nerds, T90M is the best tank that the Russians have deployed. They've got a more advanced system called T14, but they haven't deployed it. T90M is the best they've got. So when it comes to the argument that Russia isn't sending its best kit or its best equipment, well, here is its best equipment that was being used by one of its best units. This is probably a 2nd Guards Motor Rifle Division tank, which is a division of our favourite unit, the 1st Guards Tank Army. Now, some people badmouth this tank as basically being an update of the old T-72, but there's a lot of stuff about it that's actually quite impressive. It's got a remote-controlled weapon station on the roof so the commander doesn't have to stick his head out and get it shot off. It's covered in a radar and heat-insulating material called Nikitka, and it's got a range of other upgrades as well. It's the sort of piece of equipment that if this was a video game, there would be a whole mission where a Ukrainian commando unit has to sneak behind enemy lines and steal the top secret tank from the enemy base. So how was it captured, you might ask, and in what state? It threw a track. It looks like the tank threw a track, and as a result, the crew abandoned it, with no attempt to damage it or destroy it. The interior is pristine, no sign of damage or sabotage, as is the exterior. And so, in a feat of maximum irony, there are videos of the Ukrainians towing this thing away, using another Russian tank, with the broken track links trailing behind. Now, in terms of intelligence value for this vehicle, I don't know. My instinct says that Krasulka is probably more valuable, as are the jammers and electronic warfare equipment, although some Americans are probably going to want to point a whole bunch of sensors and weapon systems at that Nikitka coating in order to see just how effective it is and how it can be countered if indeed it is a problem. But there you go. An argument that Russia is indeed sending its best personified. Their best tank, operated by one of their best units, and it was abandoned after throwing a track. Nice work. In conclusion, it is complicated getting accurate data on captures and abandoned vehicles in Ukraine. There are a lot of different data sources out there, and there are limitations of the ones that we choose to use. Furthermore, BDAR processes are involved and critical. It doesn't matter how many vehicles are abandoned if you don't have the processes in place to recover and repair them. That said, captured equipment is probably the largest single source of supply for Soviet and post-Soviet type weapons to Ukraine to date especially in certain weapons categories where supplies from Europe are limited to say the least. I'll also say the Farmer Brigade is more than a meme. The use of civilian recovery and support assets is in fact a notable facet of this conflict and probably helps plug gaps in Ukraine's overstretched recovery and repair assets. Ukraine does have vulnerabilities in the capital repair part of the repair chain, but agreements with Western powers so the Poles, the Bulgarians, etc., does give them some ability to outsource that work beyond their borders. Finally, I'll note that one clear point of significance for captured abandoned equipment is when sensitive technologies fall into enemy hands. And there we do have examples of a number of sensitive Russian technologies, like Krasulka, like T-90M, falling into Ukrainian hands and potentially being transported out of the country. So whatever position you might take on the exact quantum of how much kit that Ukraine is capturing, there are clearly some items of immense significance that have been handed over. Okay, channel update to close out. Firstly, many thanks to the Chieftain for his guest appearance this week. He's excellent at what he does. He runs a fantastic channel, and he's written an interesting book called Can Openers, which I would encourage you to check out. I enjoyed devouring it on a plane flight recently. There was a fantastic response last week to the video I did on the Kharkiv counteroffensive. There has recently been an announcement of Russian, quote, partial mobilization, which I really think deserves a bit of a deep dive. I'm working on that and expect a video on that next week. In terms of patron activities, the patrons are currently uh, participating in a charity vote on where my next tranche of ground news sponsorship money goes. I'm always very happy to direct that to uh, charitable causes. So I'll announce the outcome of that vote next video. Personally, I'm, uh, I'm bloody tired trying to keep up with all this at the moment, but I will try and hold the tempo. For a little bit of fun, Terror Invicta, the game has gone into early access by the time this has gone live, and the videos for that should be on my channel. It's an excellent title that I've been waiting on for a while, so I enjoy picking up a few hours here and there in my downtime. Other than that, thank you very much to all of you for listening. I appreciate your contributions as always. I hope you stay safe, and I'll talk to you again next week.